Hi, I'm Brian with Washbox, and we're here today in Miami doing a collector conversation with Michael Kalb. Michael, great to see you. Good to see you, as always. Michael has been in finance for over 30 years. He has just about every hobby that there is. You're a professional <laughs> pilot. You're into boats. You are a race car driver. Uh, you do photography, and obviously the most special hobby of all, fine watches. Uh, fine watches is probably the closest uh, passion to my heart right now. Love it. Why don't we talk about the watch that's on your wrist today? Sure. Uh, I've got a, five, a 5960 Patek uh, 1A stainless steel bracelet, uh, only produced for a year with the black dial. This is probably one of my uh, most worn Pateks on a daily basis. Uh, I just absolutely love this watch, the case, the feel, the fit, the complications. It's a great watch. I feel like this watch really epitomizes you because it's all about uh, casualness and comfort. And you've always gravitated towards watches that you can wear all the time, even before it was cool and popular. And I feel like this watch sits like right in between that aesthetic and uh, I absolutely love it. We've talked about this on prior shows before. When you look at the 5980 you sold me back in 2009, it fits the exact profile that this watch also fits. Oh, happy you love it. So there's one watch here on the table that I know that you were excited to talk about and it's the 5109P sitting right here at the end. Look, th this watch, from a collector standpoint, is very personal to me. I purchased this in 2007 when I first moved to London. Mm -hmm. It was a move that I made to run my former firm's business. It was a critical point in my career. I walked down the, uh, in the city of London, went into a boutique, saw this Patek. It was the first Patek that I've ever purchased. It was platinum. Wow. I absolutely loved it. And two years later, it was stolen. And only after a 30-year period was I able to find another one just like it to purchase to maintain in my collection. No, and I know that you're very specific about the watches that you buy and that you'd been looking for a new example for many, many years, and I'm happy that you finally were able to purchase one. What I love about this watch, too, is the fact that even then, they were adding this track. So they were taking something that was a little bit more dressy and trying to make it a little bit more casual, and the heft of the platinum on this case is just remarkably different than the gold variants. When you have that on your wrist, you would have no idea the size of that watch. You would think it was twice the size, given how heavy it actually is. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, it's absolutely magnificent. I would say I hope the tech in the future actually really focuses more on the whole gondola line towards the men's side. I know recently they've shrunk it, but I love the gondola line. I think there's tremendous opportunity in it, and I'd like to see more of those coming. Yeah, no, I think shaped cases in general are having their heyday now. Um, I actually was thinking that uh, it was gonna be, you know, this year it was gonna be the year of the ellipse. <laughs> I just, I, I picked one up recently. I love the case, I love the shape. It's classic, it's iconic, and I just, you know, with, with the popularity of just shaped cases as a whole, even amongst many brands, you've got the Cartier Crash. Mm -hmm. um, I just think like it's, it's, it's due, to, due for a takeover. The, the discontinued 5135, which I have in my collection. Um, I think that one day is gonna be a classic watch. It's got the cushion shape on the tonneau. It is a beautiful timepiece, fits larger. It's already classic. I think it is, but I think there's room to grow. <laughs> I, think you're I think you're classic. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I've always noticed is that you have no direct collecting pattern, that you're very eccentric in your choices, um, and when you know you like it, it doesn't matter what anybody says, you're going for it. Uh, and one of those pieces that I just think absolutely epitomizes that is the Jump Hour Chanel sitting here on the table. Sure, well let me just take a step back and just comment on the fact that I look for watches that I'm gonna wear. I'm not looking for watches that my father was gonna wear. I'm not looking for watches that my grandfather is gonna wear. I want contemporary time pieces that really speak to me mm -hmm. and that are really differentiated in the market. And when you look at the Chanel Mansour, this piece on the face of it, why would a Chanel watch be in somebody's watch collection? The reality is this watch is actually contains a movement by Roman Gauthier, mm -hmm. who designed it, who actually produces the components for it, and it is just an absolute hidden gem, which I love to wear regularly. I think, and why I love this is because it's one of those, like, for those that know, know. And in the watch industry, you have a lot of different manufacturers that make different movements for different brands. You've got watchmakers that are responsible for different parts of different products. And I think that once you dive into some of these watches and you learn more, it's kind of like, like wow, like that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Why don't more people know about this? And, and like one of the prime examples 
for me is LV watches. You mm -hmm. know, they're produced by Fabrique du Temps. Yep. The watchmakers behind this, this company are responsible for some of like the finest watches that have been made um, across many other brands. And so you've got Anita Porsche doing the dials for some of their pieces. And so when you start diving into that, like you're like, wow, like the makeup of these watches is very similar to what the Holy Trinity is doing. And so it's not just about the brand on the dial, you have to look at the watch itself. I actually think the watch industry has moved on from the Holy Trinity. Mm -hmm. I'll get a lot of debate, I'll get a lot of heat from that. But I think when you look at all the independent brands that have come out of the market that are so differentiated, it really has moved the watch industry completely forward. Chanel has actually been a major player in helping that happen. They have a vested interest in Jorn, they have a vested interest in Rowan Gauthier. Bell and Ross. Bell and Ross. Well, we won't get into Bell and Ross. <laughs> uh, but, but they really are focused on the future of the watch industry and where it's going. Mm -hmm. And I know that you've mentioned over the last several years in particular just how you're now gravitating more towards the independence uh, because you sort of feel this beating from the brand um, and that that's where you're sort of seeing some of the innovation that's taking place. And the next order of business on the table is, I would say, probably the most well-known independent watchmaker today, F.P. Journe. So why don't you tell us a little bit how you got, uh, what fascinated you about this piece and, and, and why this one? You know, um, I missed the boat on F.P. Journe. You know, I, Many did. I have over a dozen Patek watches in my collection, as you are well aware. And as I've gone down the independent journey, Journe was one that I continued to watch from afar. Um, but when I finally jumped in, I wanted to jump in in a very special, unique way. And with the Dubai edition, the green dial, the green strap, it really spoke to me. It's reflective of the decade that I spent living abroad, traveling throughout the Middle East, mm -hmm. and whenever I put that on my wrist, it just constantly reminds me of one, how beautiful of a watch it is that Jean produced, but two, my time abroad for 10 years. And I know that you, you, know, you wanted something simple, something elegant, but you also wanted it to be a little bit more different and unique. And that's why when you had landed on this one, I knew that it was the perfect choice because it sort of checked every single box that you look for when you're gonna be acquiring a new watch. I remember when you told me about this watch and you first showed it to me, my reaction was simple, yes. So what do you think the, your next one would be? Well, I have another uh, sovereign, but a white dial one, mm -hmm. which is more simple, more basic. Mm -hmm. And I've yet to decide on which direction that goes after that. <laughs> But uh, I mean, not to go in order, but I think we can talk about another, because uh, you've got two more independents here on the table. Sure. Um, one of them is a Di Bethune, which is mm -hmm. actually one of your most recent acquisitions. Yeah, the Di Bethune, I just recently purchased about two months ago. And if I uh, recall correctly, I've been trying different ones on for over a year. Mm -hmm. I've been studying the brand for over a year. Mm -hmm. um, when I look at watches that I purchase, I'm very focused on the brand, the heritage, the history, mm -hmm the engineering, the in-house movements, and I've become just fascinated by De Bethune, and this was the first perfect entree into the De Bethune market for me. And I know that for you, what I've seen is that you wear every single watch you own. Nothing sits in a box, uh, nothing collects dust. And you were a little bit hesitant just regarding the articulating lugs, how they would fit your wrist. And so you wanted to wait to be able to see it in person, try it on, to be able to make that final decision. And I think that's sort of what, what did it for you. The articulating lugs really make it. At first, when you look at the watch, it seems oversized. When you put it on the wrist, it actually fits beautifully. I could travel with this watch anywhere in the world, and it's just an incredible timepiece on my wrist. I love that. I've got to get you the sports strap. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting. <laughs> Um, but uh, another independent there, right to the right, mm -hmm. uh, H. Moser, another brand that I know that you just love. Uh, you know, it's really interesting. My journey towards H. Moser has been going on for quite a few years. A lot of my collector friends would say, Mike, how come you don't have Moser in your collection? Um, a lot of different watch enthusiasts would wonder, why isn't Moser in my collection? The ADs. Moser kept coming up time and time again, conversation after conversation. I used to say to myself, it's another contemporary independent watch brand vying for my attention amongst others. What's so special about it? And so my first Moser purses was actually a Venture XL, mm -hmm. uh, the Venture Black version, and I enjoyed it. But this is the watch that really grabbed my attention. The HMC 800 movement inside of this perpetual calendar is probably the easiest and simplest perpetual calendar watch, not only to set, mm -hmm. but also to wear. 
It's got a clean dial, it's got the date, it's got a power reserve on it. The fact that the back has the jump years on it, uh, the set leap it years on it. You can set it forwards and backwards. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love this watch, and this has just made me a huge Moser fan. One of the things that I think they've done such an amazing job doing is taking you know, traditional watchmaking and making it a little bit easier to understand, but also they've been trendsetters. And so even as far down as you take a watch, you took a watch like this, you look at it and you're like, okay, like pretty classic in terms of appearance, but you've got the Fume blue black dial, and which is something that you now see as being more prevalent amongst many watch brands. But for a while it was just them doing it. And I think that you can sort of see how um, when something really great catches on that other brands start following suit, but, but they, were the, uh, they were the first ones really to start, to start doing that process. And it's actually one of the reasons why um, I think collectors come to the brand because you know, you're sort of, they're the ones that started it. I, I also think their recent announced partnership with Aganor is gonna do some tremendous things for the, so for the brand. Mm -hmm. Obviously they have the Aganor Agongraph movement inside their Streamliner mm -hmm. Chronograph, which is a phenomenal timepiece. Um, I think The fact that they have the rotor inverted, and so that, it, oh, it, it, so that it looks like a manual wine watch, but it's automatic, and like it's the best of both worlds. It's and behind so, the like, dial. <laughs> it's something that like once I learned about that feature, I didn't understand why everybody didn't do that because it's like it's remarkable. You look at it and you're like, wow, like that's like a complex looking chronograph, but like really, it's self winding. It, it is a phenomenal timepiece, and I've got uh, high expectations for what they're going to be able to come out with in the future. So before we end with the the big Cahoon at the end, why don't we talk a little bit about the the Long and Zone that you have here? Uh, so the Long and Zone Zeitwerk date. This watch, was, the basic Zeitwerk, was launched in 2009. And I remember way back when, when I first saw the Zeitwerk date, I was the Zeitwerk, I was just amazed. Here's a jumping hour digital watch in a mechanical form, which to me was just incredibly impressive. The date itself has a more recent movement in it. It takes so much power to drive this watch. It's got a remitoire, double barrel. It is an unbelievable engineering feat that they've been able to accomplish with this. For me, I mean, I remember, I remember when the, the Zeitwerk launched like vividly. It was 2009, as you mentioned. It was the first year that I really entered into the watch space full time. And it was a rocket ship for the brand. I mean, the aesthetic at that time was much more traditional from Patek, Vacheron. And for them to do a jump hour, jump minute, it was like against the grain, it was different, it was more youthful, um, and it was coming from Longa. And so, like, I just, I remember that period in time, it, like, the brand just completely took off. New collectors came in, everybody wanted the watch, and, like, I think even the popularity of the brand to this day is in large part due to them launching that watch when they did. I, I think this is clearly part of it. I think their, um, uh, uh, the chronographs are certainly part of it. You know, I have one of the, the Datagraph Up and Downs, which is also one of my favorite watches. Mm -hmm. um, I think the Richard Lang, uh, Port de Marie, uh, which has a chain and fusey transmission, constant force mechanism is it. They're doing some incredible things from a mechanical standpoint. Awesome. Uh, moving to the last piece on the tray. So here we have the, okay. I mean, again, you've got the new 5811 1G from Patek. Precious metal, 41 millimeters, blue dial. We had talked for many years about how you'd felt the 5711 was just a little bit too light on your wrist. And if only they would make something that was a little bit heavier and then Boom, they came out with this piece. When they launched this piece, I think you were the first call I made as soon as I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was a lot of people's first call oh, no. when they launched this watch. You know, th this, this watch fits me like a glove. Um, the white gold, precious metal, as you said, the 51 millimeter size. I love the new blue dial on it, the aesthetics of it. This is, to me, what the Nautilus should have always been. Um, I'm a big fan of white metals, but what I also love about this watch is the new micro adjustment on the bracelet, which I think just makes it that much easier to wear and, and self-adjusting over time, and especially for a sports watch, just necessary in this day and age. You could wear this watch in shorts. You could wear it in a tuxedo. It suits all purposes. Be beach to tux, as we like to say. Just not in the water. I'm not putting that on the beach. <laughs> None of the watches I wear go in the beach. <laughs> <laughs> well, beautiful. Um, so, Michael, when you're making decisions about where you're gonna take your collection uh, or what watch you're gonna purchase next. Like, what types of things 
come into the picture for you? I mean, are you thinking about the brand? Are you thinking about just the watch? Like, or is, is it an equation of both? It, it's, a great, it's a great question. I think when you're making a decision on a watch and a watch that you want in your collection, you're looking at everything from the brand to the design ethos, to the movement, to the heritage. All those come into play. For me, I start with the brand. Mm -hmm. And that's the top place to start with. What is the heritage? What is the history? What is the level of innovation, which I think is still required even today to drive brands forward? Mm -hmm. And then I, once I get a knowledge base of that, then I look at the individual timepieces. Mm -hmm. What are the movements made out of? What are the design ethos of the individual movements? And that's how I decide what brands I get into and which watches I want to have. And I know that you're a, you're a big fan of innovation, um, just in terms of what you've accomplished in your career, you sort of take that lens with fine watches. And that's why, even though you do get into the brand, um, you care a lot about what the actual watch itself is. You know, one of the watches we don't have here is the 5905P, which is an annual calendar watch. Mm -hmm. To think that I was 27 years old when Patek introduced an annual calendar watch, mm -hmm. that was still within my lifetime. You know, that was very innovative at that time. I think innovation is a key factor in driving any watch producer forward. And I, you know, and what's interesting is, is I think innovation is also something that Patek doesn't get enough credit for. I think that they sort of have that image of being your dad's watch, um, but they're responsible for um, modern day technology, silicium in watches. I mean, they're responsible for the <laughs> annual calendar. I mean, there's a lot of things that they've done uh, that have pushed watchmaking forward. I buy watches that I want to wear. I don't buy watches that my father will wear. I don't buy watches that my grandfather will wear. And the vast majority of my collection is in Patex. Well, I would actually argue if the vast majority of my collection is Patex, but it's not the watch that I think my father would wear, mm -hmm. and it's not the watch that I think my grandfather would wear, they are actually moving with the market, with uh, innovation, 100%, 100%. with the design ethos, and I think they continue to do so. And so I know that you're methodical in your choices. Sometimes you prune from the collection, sometimes you don't. Um, where do you see it going forward for you? I mean, are there things that you're targeting? I mean, are there, is, are there certain brands that you don't yet have that you're, that you're sort of on your radar to pick up next? Um, uh, Agrubal is probably definitely on the list that we've had much discussion about. Uh -huh. <laughs> And at some point, we'll find the right one that I think. Um, I'd like to see that in my collection. Um, but I think after that, with the existing portfolio of brands that I have, I would stick to maintain with those brands and just build upon them. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Unless something exceptional comes out. Now, I know that you, that you collect with friends and that you guys have worked with manufacturers to produce watches for your friends group. Um, would you say that they have similar tastes in watches to you? I mean, do you push them? Do they push you? Um, you know, I think uh, we were talking about the, the Lurica, number one, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, that is just a great way for 50 people to get involved in creating a watch that is a incredible movement, timeless timepiece, um, that probably would have been unattainable otherwise mm -hmm. uh, for that group. Um, that being said, uh, there's others coming down the, down the pipeline which are even going to be more creative than the first one. Uh, very enthusiastic to be able to participate with that. Um, but seeing an independent watch grow and blossom in the process that is required to go through there and the complexity of it, that for me is what the real joy has been. Oh, that's great. I'm excited to see the finished product. I saw the first one. It was beautiful. <laughs> so what's, what's a grail watch to you, I would say? I mean, I feel, I feel like that's a question that that I always like asking because you learn a lot about yep. a person from, from the answer, but if you had to sort of list like a grail watch, uh, well, what would it be? In the first point, many of these watches can be considered grail watches. Of course. There's no question about that. Um, and clearly I have some uh, orders coming that <laughs> uh, will, will certainly be some grail watches as well. Um, but a grail watch to me is one where the watch speaks to me in every single facet and form. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what's considered a grail. I have many grails. And I wear each one of these watches, whether it's a grail watch or a more basic watch. You know, I probably switch watches two times a day. Um, regardless of where I am, whether I'm in Central America, whether I'm in Europe, whether I'm in the States, I've always got a couple of pieces with me in my collection. Um, and it doesn't matter whether it's a grail watch or a more moderate watch. You know, Nomos, 
I love as a brand for a more value-oriented brand. I think they're doing a fantastic mm -hmm. job. Um, the fact that I have a few Hermes with voucher movements, I think they're incredible watches. But it's all based on what I perceive as a true collector's piece, not what other people perceive. And I think that that's you know sort of back to this idea of like the more you learn about a product, the more you can understand like why it's special. And Hermes again, another example of a brand that probably doesn't have as high a reputation as it should for its watchmaking. You know, they do a lot within the rare handcrafts that I edit an exceptionally high level. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a watch that they launched a few years back was the Rotating Moon, which I thought which was Which like, I have one of. <laughs> which you have one of, which I thought was an ingenious way of displaying time and displaying mm -hmm. the moon phase. Um, and again, it's a novel complication that got a lot of street cred from within, like the in the weeds watch collector community, but not so much outside that. Hey, they, they just won two GPHG awards last year for their women's watch and for their uh, men's complication on the travel piece. Mm -hmm. Michael, thank you so much for bringing your collection today. I mean, it's always amazing uh, getting to hang out in person, and I really appreciate you uh, bringing these remarkable pieces onto, uh, onto our channel. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for being a part of my journey for over 30 years to help me build my collection.